It's the George Plaster Show. 30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee. Featuring Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer Watson Brown. And it's a shame it's taken this long to get an introduction for this Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Kelly Holcomb, along with young gun Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in on a beautiful Monday in Nashville. Temperature up toward 80 degrees, supposed to be that way over the next four days, which is awesome. And we welcome all of you into our digs at the Ford Ice Center in Bellevue. Kelly Holcomb out today, back tomorrow. And then Wednesday, of course, we have the big Wilson Bank and Trust Sports Speaker Series show with the legendary Alabama play-by-play voice Eli Gold and former Titans coach Jeff Fisher. If you want to make a reservation to be out here at 11.30 on Wednesday morning, email me at plastergeorge at gmail.com. We're going to have about 100 people out here to watch it. There is uh there are the pictures. Nice shades. Yeah, those are some nice shades. Yeah. I wonder if I'll wear them on uh, on Wednesday. I doubt it. Billy, how are you? I'm good. Good weekend? Yeah, good weekend. Beautiful okay. weather. Yeah. We were uh we were blessed with some good weather this weekend, that's for sure. But and it, and it still cooled down at night though. That was the weird thing where at least where I was, we you know, we were kind of outside all day, and then it kind of cooled off a little bit. So we're not quite where the nighttime is is still comfortable. I mean, we've had some nights here or there where. No, but hold on a second before you at go at least there, the past couple of days before you go there tonight, for instance, low of sixty three, and it does not get into the sixties until about ten o'clock. So we're getting there. Yeah, we're we're getting there. We're getting real close. It did. Have, it was. I mean, it was perfect over the weekend, though. So yeah, it was. It was good. Okay, we have a big update to go with a big show. We have found some different kind of stories today, three of which are in football, one of which is hoops. I think you'll enjoy. You'll learn some things. Yeah, big show today. But we're going to start with uh, a somber note. Former Alabama All-American quarterback and Vanderbilt coach Steve Sloan has passed away at the age of 79. So, unfortunate for him and his family. Only 79. So, obviously, yeah. you know, sad for a lot of people that uh, that knew him. And he was at a lot of different programs. I, I didn't even realize he was the athletic director at USC. And, uh, you know, made a, made a lot of stops. You, and, no, hold on. Was it Central Florida? I saw something today. He was the athletic director at USC. Uh, no, not Southern Cal. I guess I was, I don't know. I guess I saw that wrong. I don't so, know. Billy, the, the story, and, and for people who are older, they'll remember this. Uh, his second year at Vandy, they go to the Peach Bowl. They play Texas Tech. And ironically, Texas Tech is trying to lure him to move to Lubbock as their football coach. Uh, Coach Sloan had made huge inroads very early with a staff that included former NFL uh, legend Bill Parcells. His recruiting coordinator was Larry Schmidto. Mm. How about that? How about that? And um, anyway, um, Coach Sloan makes the decision on New Year's Eve to turn the job down at Texas Tech. Something happened between then and um, 
about two o'clock the next afternoon, New Year's Day, where Channel 5 sportscaster at the time, Hope Hines, broke into the Cotton Bowl to announce that Sloan had changed his mind and decided to go to Texas Tech. So, when he came back to Vandy as Watson Brown's offensive coordinator for Watson's final season, I was doing a package of games on, on a replay that would run at 1030 at night. We're coming back from Georgia, where we've gotten beat around pretty good by the old dogs. And Coach, Coach Sloan, who I really didn't know at that time, says, can I sit with you? Absolutely. Plane takes off, and I hit him with an absolute bomb. I said, Coach, I said, you need to know that I'm the only person on this plane that remembers December 31st of 1974. And the look on his face, he goes, are you serious? And I said, yep. And he goes, why? I said, I was devastated. And he's like, why? And I said, because you were the first time in my life that Vandy football had been any fun. In his second year, they beat the Florida Gators here, lost to Georgia 38-31. Tennessee was forced into a two-point conversion at the buzzer to forge a 21-21 tie. Vandy football for a couple of years was really fun, wide open. Coach Sloan was a good man. Uh, I hated to hear this uh, because uh, Billy, the other one was he uh, that they did, and I want to say this has been about fifteen years ago that they um, they had him and the entire Peach Bowl team come back to town, and they asked if I would have him on, and I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, he was very close friends with Nashvilleian Lou Connor, and uh, there are a bunch of us really sad to hear this news. Yeah, Coach Sloan was a good man. Yeah, so he obviously has uh, passed away in prayers to uh, to his family, of course. Uh, also, yesterday, Scotty Scheffler closes with a 68 and wins another Masters title. He entered yesterday's final round, leading by one shot. He ran away from the field on the second nine to win his second green jacket in three years. He carded a four under 68 in the final 18 holes to finish at 11 under for the tournament. The The Swede, Ludwig Auberg, almost um, almost made it, well, he did, you know, make uh, make him make it hard on Scheffler, but uh, Scheffler became the fourth youngest golfer to win multiple green jackets. Only Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, and Steve Ballesteros were, Seve were younger. Ballesteros. Se- oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> No T there. Seve Ballesteros were uh, were younger. You know, I actually saw um, at one point. There's a name I hadn't heard in years. Jose Marie Olathabel. It was good to see Joe Mary. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Tiger uh, finished at 16 over 304, a career worst, despite posting his highest round. Uh, in his career, he did say it was a good week. And I, I mean, I would agree with that because he did set a record. Because he got 24th, through it. 24th consecutive made cut, which is pretty ridiculous if you think about you know what he's been through. So, uh, Tiger Woods, 16 over 304. Not a great finish for Tiger, but. Do you want to see him retire? I mean, at this point, I, yeah. I mean, he's not really, you know. And I, what got it kind of annoying to me, you know, he made the cut. And you know, everybody's still talking about him, but he's he's irrelevant to the to the top of the leaderboard. Like, I know it's this is Tiger Woods we're talking about, but um, you know, there's other people at the top of the leaderboard that weren't even being talked about as much as Tiger was. And I know, I mean, he's he's a legend, but I thought that got a little overblown. Like you know, the guy's ninety over. <laughs> like it's getting a little ridiculous. But but isn't it amazing? Even with those scores, they would show him constantly. Yeah. Because yeah. he's just like Caitlin Clark. He moves the needle. He really does. And he had a special moment with uh, Vern Lundquist uh, after, of course, yeah. you know, this is the last Masters for Vern. 40th time he's called a Masters, which is nuts. Um, and he's 83. And he was still able to, obviously, he's not at his best, but, you know, he's still 
still Vern, and uh, obviously a lot of those calls you still get chills on. And uh, he did have a special moment with Vern, which I thought was cool. Vern and Eli are big buddies. We I, may talk to we may talk to Eli Wednesday about Vern. I have a feeling. I didn't know Vern was eighty three. Wow, crazy. Good for him. Yeah, and he. Uh, I mean, you could tell how old he he is because of how young he looked in a lot of the a lot the, of the uh, pictures, the clips and yeah. pictures they were showing. So wow. Uh, Shot Scheffler, Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters, his second in three years. Uh, also yesterday, it was a big Sunday in the sports world. Kentucky's Mark Pope was introduced in front of a sold out Rupp Arena crowd. Now think about that. You've never been to Rupp, have you? No. So I have broadcast eight games there. And never come close to winning. Mark Pope's national title team in 96 beat my Vanderbilt teams by a combined 83. They Goodness. ripped us to shreds. That national title team that he was a part of, they were really good. That is, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he did have a, some good quotes. He said, I understand the assignment. We are here to win banners. As we go through this journey, we're here to win banners in Nashville at the SEC tournament because you guys turn out in Nashville like nobody else, and that matters. And our job here and our assignment is here to win banners in the Final Four National Championships. That is our job. We will talk about his hire and show you some of the pictures from Rupp because it's pretty. It, it's really an amazing story that – on really short notice, that fan base, which is by far the most active college basketball fan base in the country, turned out to the point where they had to turn away. Listen to this. They turned away 5,000 people who wanted to get in to see this. That is insane. That's ridiculous. It's crazy. And they love, I mean, obviously we know how much they love Kentucky basketball, but it did feel like a little bit of a, like they're back. The, the fans are finally a big part of the program. Again, not that they haven't been, but obviously Calipari made it all about uh, him and bringing, hit, you know, bringing his one and done guys in. So Kentucky does have Mark Pope, and I think we'll show uh, the video of the 1996 National Championship team walking out of the bus. So that'll be, that'll be cool. Uh, also the Preds, their potential NHL playoff opponent, was impacted by Vegas's win last night. After the Canucks beat the Oilers 3-1 to one on Saturday, the Preds were all but guaranteed to face the Canucks in the first round. Oh, uh, not so fast. All they needed to do was lock up with the first wild card spot to make it happen. But then last night, Vegas won over Colorado in OT, and this now creates a scenario where if the Preds don't get at least one point tonight, Against Pittsburgh, uh, Vegas knows? could sneak into the first wild card spot. They could. So here is a thought for the Colorado Avalanche. You ready? Let's hear it. Uh, <laughs> up three nothing, going to the third period and gagged it. And to be honest, I saw the third period. It was on TNT. From about the ten minute mark on, you could feel it coming. All of a sudden, the Vegas crowd got into it, and they're a great crowd uh, at whatever. The, I think it's T-Mobile is, mm -hmm. is their arena. And when it got to 3-2, to two, I was like, oh, crap. Here well, we go. And Vegas was obviously more desperate than Colorado, and that's what you get in these these NHL games. A little bit. And that could be the case with Pittsburgh tonight. It's not oh, going to be. Pittsburgh's in the middle of a log jam race. There are about four teams in there. That, uh, that are fighting. Detroit is one of them. Pittsburgh's one of them. I think Washington is one of them, and I don't remember the fourth. It is not going to be easy tonight no. for, uh, for the Preds. And, and meanwhile, Vegas plays two non-playoff non teams at home to finish their season. So it's not looking great all of a sudden for the Preds to no, get that No, but the flip spot. side of it is the L.A. Kings are also in this as well. One of those two teams – will be the third team in their division. So one of them is going to move past all this junk, and it's possible before the week's over that the Preds are more worried about the L.A. Kings than they are about Vegas. Now, if they can take care of business tonight and get an overtime tie or an outright win, this will all work out fine. But do not be surprised. Pittsburgh needs a two-point win in regulation 
do not be surprised if that game's tied late if Pittsburgh does not remove their goaltender to try to force the issue in regulation. This is going to be a weird deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll see tonight. What time's puck drop in that Six. one? Six. o'clock tonight in Pittsburgh. So, big one for the Preds. Again, a lot of these have been big. So, we'll uh, we'll have to see about that. But that's that's what I got. Okay, here's what we've got today. Interesting show for you. In a moment, you're going to learn a little bit more about what goes on involving the NFL draft. Because not every player went to Oklahoma or Michigan. There are young people out there, Tennessee Tech, Austin P, however you want to say it, who have to fight through a series of obstacles to get noticed. We'll talk with one of the guys trying to make that happen right now. Former Austin P quarterback Mike Delello will join us. We'll talk Kentucky's hire at 245. At 3 o'clock today, John Stiff, a sports writer in the area, with an interesting story that, to be honest, I didn't catch a couple of weeks ago involving Titan PSLs, and I think all of you are going to want to hear that. And then, um, Jason Aldridge, uh, help me with that a minute. Give me uh, the name again. Jason Aldridge. Yeah, Aldridge. I almost called him Albright. Uh, Jason Aldridge is going to join us. His company... Now, look, I'm not saying this right, but they have a gizmo, a piece of machinery that will line a football field or a baseball field without humans having to do it. It's pretty cool. We're going to find out about it at 325. Busy day on the show. Do not go anywhere. The George Plaster Show. Boy, isn't that an original title? Continues after this. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bart Durham. And you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, it sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. I'm Watson Brown. I'm Kelly Holcomb. I'm Billy Derrick. We're the George Plaster Show. We've been Nashville's best sports talk for the last 30 years. And you know what? We still are. Catch us live weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time in Nashville on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, the podcast version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. From embroidery to screen-printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges, they have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, 
custom cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen printed t-shirts, laser engraved Yeti cups, and knives. Recognize your hardworking team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolensville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615-256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. Okay, we're back. When you hear this story in a few minutes, you're going to realize that not everybody is the number one pick in the draft. Not everybody went to Oklahoma or Texas or Clemson or Alabama. There are a lot of folks working very hard just simply to try to get noticed, to try to get an invite into an NFL training camp. One of those uh, I've gotten to know a little bit. He's Austin P's uh, former quarterback, Mike Delello, who joins us from down in Florida. So can you play that guitar? I can. I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hung up in my room. So, <laughs> so Billy, do we need to hear him play this thing? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so you made the decision, and I don't know when, that – once your Austin P football life was over, that you wanted to see how far you could take this. Mm -hmm. When did you make that decision? It's funny you say that because me and my parents kind of talk about it time and time again. Like if you told me coming out of high school that I was going to have an opportunity to, you know, go to the NFL draft and hopefully be a part of an NFL organization, fingers crossed. But I mean, I had an interesting college career, played at a division two school for my first two years. And then um, Middle Tennessee State, uh, getting my degree there, earning my undergrad, and then getting my master's at Austin P. And it really wasn't until my last year realizing that if I had a good enough season, seeing, you know, because we haven't really seen a lot of F FCS guys in the NFL as of late, you know, the past three or four years, the, the North Dakota States, the South Dakota States, kids like that are getting their chance and opportunity at, at a high FCS level. So it really wasn't until that barrier was broken and I had the opportunity my last season at Austin P to really make a push for it and, you know, if you're not going to go for the whole thing, why do it at all? So, you know, honestly, what it really does is make the Phil Sims story all that much more remarkable. Came out of Moorhead State uh, and got noticed, which, I mean, when you think about it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's like I said, it's, it's a tough barrier to crack. And those guys that do do it, they play the best of the best at the FCS level. And then even then, sometimes it's not even sometimes it's not even possible, but it's, it's definitely been a journey so far. So, so kind of take me through chronologically all the steps since your Austin P football season was over, the things you've tried to do to get on people's radar screen. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, as soon as the season was over, um, finding a place to go train because understanding that, you know, you only have a certain amount of time for those pro days. And luckily enough, the Austin P State has a relationship with the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So I was able to do my pro day there. So first finding out where I was going to train and I kind of had an interesting kind of story with that because I was going to stay in Clarksville, Tennessee and train with the coaching staff there. The strength coach, Coach Chris Campbell is phenomenal. And um, that's who we, we were going to train with. I had a buddy, a tight end who was also training. And um, but the head coach, Coach Scotty Walden, he got the head coaching job at University of Texas El Paso. So uh, as soon as me and uh, my buddy Jordan heard that, we were like, all right, I guess we're doing a road trip. So we. We, we traveled all the way to um, El Paso, Texas, and we trained out there for about eight to ten weeks. Um, yeah, there's a Sun Bowl right yeah. there. <laughs> it's, I, I'll tell you what, it's a, as a kid that's come from South Florida and, you know, you see summer all year long and it's pretty flat terrain going in, training in the mountains in that altitude is uh, – it's definitely definitely was an experience. And it was, it was something that I'll cherish because, like I said, not a lot of people get to go through that and um, – but yeah, so that was kind of the first step was finding a place to train. And once we did that, then you kind of go through the vetting of the agent process, which is which is so new to everybody. You know, you, not a lot of people get to just have agents that help them out. So trying to understand who's real and who's not and and who has your best interests at the end of the day. So um, have a great agent, Hadley Englehard, um, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, 
kind of had some connections through people, people that we knew, knew each other, um, family, family kind of relations. So that was a good, um, pick up there. And then, um, then ever since then, it's just been kind of just training and kind of waiting around, you know, you, when you, you finally, I finally got to, to the pro day, which was March 26th at university of Tennessee. Um, like I said, fortunate enough to do that because there was upwards of 25, 28 NFL teams there and kind of building those relationships through them and, you know, having your agent be the middleman as well. So it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of an interesting process to say the least. Okay. So when you get to Knoxville for pro day, indoor or Neyland stadium? We were in the indoor, we were in the indoor. It was, which, um, which is, they have a phenomenal facility. Uh, it's, it, it was unreal to be in there. Just, them to, you know, have, have the courtesy of letting us in there and doing that was great. So, um, no, we did everything in their weight room. So, you know, the bench, the vert and all that kind of stuff was in the weight room and that's connected right into the indoor. So then we just traveled in to do our forties. And, and then afterwards we were uh, lucky enough that they, they all wanted us to do football specific drills as well. So threw the ball around for about 20, 30 minutes afterwards that too. So. Yeah. And, uh, the Billy, the reason I asked him about Neyland stadium, Mike played there. His Austin P team played Tennessee. Yeah. And Mike helped me. What was it? Something crazy at halftime. Yeah, Either the score was were... uh, Yeah, so the score go. was seven seven to six with about two minutes left in the in the first half. And they hit a big deep one and then up getting in the red zone with about fifteen seconds left. So the score was thirteen to six at halftime. We opened up and I'll never forget, you know. People tell you you're going to play at 102,000 people. Like you could say that all you want. You know, at practice, we're pumping, you know. <laughs> All, all the music, all the crowd noise, but there, there's nothing like that first third down and I'm screaming the play and my running back's about two feet to the left of me and he can't even hear me. So it's 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 a type of experience you can't you can't fathom until you're actually there. And I'm guessing you heard Rocky Top a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Listen, we had that on repeat from Monday all the way to Friday before we took the road trip there. So I think I've heard Rocky Top enough for the rest of my life. I think I'm good. You know, uh the uh I guess my last year of doing Vandy was Peyton Manning's last year at Tennessee. Yeah. And I get caught in the middle of the vol walk. I had parked, you know, and a lot of people from middle Tennessee know me and they're like, what are you doing? You know, I'm the only person that doesn't have orange on. It can be a little intimidating. Yeah, but, it was, uh, it, it was crazy, but it was definitely a great experience. I mean, it's something that those guys, like you said, as FCS guys, you don't really have the opportunity to play in front of that many people that often. And luckily we did. So it was, it was, and plus it was a great game too. We didn't get blown out. I think we only lost by two touchdowns. So, so take me through once you have the pro day, then I'm guessing here, agent gets reports out to teams. Hey, my guy killed it. He's the next, uh, Roger Staubach. How does that process go to then get teams to notice you? Yeah, it's it's kind of a two-way street, whereas the scouts and the agents kind of go back and forth. From what I understand, from what I've been a part of, it's, um, you know, if the scouts are interested, they reach out and, and they know, okay, so-and-so from this school has this agent. Because when you go to all these pro days and things, you have to fill out tens and thousands of papers and it says, you know, where you're from, all this, that, and the other, and you have to list your agent and their contact information. So it's all in a database where all these people can kind of pull from. So it's not just, I have to give my agent's number to all 32 teams. Once, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars have it, then that gets blasted to the other 31 teams. So it's kind of a, kind of a two-way street through that. But, um, no, after the pro day, I was actually, I got reached out right before pro day happened at university of Tennessee, where I got to do a local day for the Miami dolphins. So uh, I, I've, March 26th was the pro day. And then April 5th was um, the pro day with the dolphins. And there was a bunch of pro days. I was actually, they were trying to get me into doing the Tennessee Titans one, but it ended up just being a number situation where they only needed one quarterback. So I actually, I was the second man up to get invited to the Tennessee Titans uh, local day. And now used to be able to go to all these local days, but now they're specifically called local days because you have to be in a certain mile range of where your home is or your school. So that's why I was able to do the Tennessee Titans one as well. Okay, Billy, let's pull up the Wes Welker photos. Okay. Uh-huh. Now, arguably as good a slot receiver as we've ever seen in in the day and time where, you know, they start designating, okay, you're not just a wide receiver, you're a slot receiver. Wes Welker under Brady was an absolute magician. I know you really liked him. Tell me about meeting up with him. It's just one of those things, obviously, like like you just said, I mean, I think he's the best slot receiver of all time. I think he's phenomenal. But and 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 the reason I say is because he's such a technician 
in, in what he does. He's so detail oriented and, you know, watching him run the drills and with those receivers, because we obviously worked hand in hand when we were doing our local day, we're throwing to them and everything and watching him orchestrate how receivers were getting in and out of breaks and how he was using certain steps and certain angles to push certain ways. It was just, it was just amazing to watch. And, and, you know, I, I would say like, Oh, it's, it's amazing to see, but you'd expect no, nothing less from him as a guy who had to be that, that way to do as well as he did in the NFL. And, and other than the football side, we had a quick short two to three minute conversation and just a stand up dude from what I got really genuine. And it was just a great experience to shake his hand and, you know, talk to him for a little bit. Yeah. And, Look, there's no doubt that in his pro career, he and Brady, it's like they never had to say anything. Brady knew where he was going. The ball was there, and boom. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, as a quarterback, you kind of have those relationships. Obviously, there is at another level, but you definitely have those relationships with certain guys that you trust, and it's kind of a, a nonverbal nod before the play that happens, and you understand, you know, we see it, I see it. This is going to be a big play for us, and obviously – they did that to perfection at, at the top top level of performance. So, Okay, take me through, because some of us have seen it in hard knocks, Mike McDaniel, he's a different bird, and he's kind of refreshing in the way he is a different bird. Tell me about him. Yeah, he uh, so he led our offensive, our, play, our whole team meeting when all the guys were there, offense and defense, and just the aura he has when you walk into a room, you just – it's just a guy who loves ball, man. Like he's just like the way he, the way he brings the, the, the energy in the room. It's a guy you want to play for regardless of, you know, like I said, I only had that 15 minute team meeting and we kind of shook hands afterwards, but it's just a guy who you could tell is a pretty genuine dude. And there is a, uh, obviously there's a sense of professional ability. He's an NFL coach, but there's also a sense of person, like a personal relationship you can have with that guy. And I think that's a huge, a huge thing when it comes to the player coach relationship. Obviously there is a hierarchy. You understand this is your boss, but you need to have that personal interaction. I think that, I mean, from the brief interaction I had, that, that that's what I got from him. So. Yeah. So is it as simple now NFL draft is a week from Thursday. Is it as simple as once this thing is over, there's this mad scramble of signing free agents. Is that right now what you're hoping for is that once that draft is over, that you're one of those free agents that starts getting calls? Yeah, exactly. So after that, after, you know, Saturday, April 27th, when that clock hits zero on the Mr. Irrelevant, whoever that is, um, then that's when you you're hopefully that's when all those phone calls come out for free agency. So it's, UDFA undrafted free agents and they that's where all the mini camp and, and training camp invites go on. So there's like the, the rookie camp and then there's training camp. So, you know, if, if, if you go the hardest route, you get the rookie camp. And um, then you, once you make it through rookie camp, you have to get invited to training camp. And then I want to say there's about 85 to 90 guys that go to training camp per team. And um, then you got to make the 53 man roster. So it's definitely a, uh, a big journey up ahead, but definitely that, that is the goal. Once that draft is over, hopefully get, getting a call from at least somebody that wants to meet me to come for training camp and, you know, get out there and show them what I could do. So I, I think I've told you, I've got a buddy that, that uh, I've remained close friends with who went the route that you're trying to go and had about a 15 year NFL career, Billy Volick mm -hmm. and Billy in his rookie year. When, when he ends up with the Titans, I'm doing their – I'm their color announcer on their TV preseason broadcasts. And for the first three games of the preseason, Jeff Fisher was nice enough to have a meeting with me and John Dwyer to talk about, hey, here are trick plays we may run if you got any questions. Uh, Coach, what about Billy Volick? You know, you told me he's not going to make the team. Sure looks like he is. He keeps getting stuff done. And I think it was aggravating Jeff a little bit. So we get to Chicago for the fourth and final preseason game. And um, Jeff's going through, here's some plays we may run, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, what questions do you have? And I don't ask anything. And he looks at me, he goes, no Billy Volick questions? Nope. And he goes, you sure? Got nothing. And all of a sudden it hits him. He goes, you're going to Wrigley Field, aren't you? I said, the minute you stop, 
I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a day that was Wrigley Field and then Soldier Field that night to do a game. And that was, uh, I was in hog heaven doing that. Look, I, I really, well, first of all, just know that, you know, there are others out there who have pulled off this battle. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Billy spent almost 15 years. I will tell you one other funny thing. When, when he left the Titans in free agency, he calls me when it looks like he's going to sign with the San Diego chargers. And I said, that's the perfect place. And he goes, why do you think that? I said, because Philip Rivers is going to get hurt a bunch. He can't move a lick. He has no mobility, and you're going to play a lot. Well, uh, revisionist history indicates that <laughs> while Philip Rivers could not move a lick, that he could bob and dance and weave in the pocket, Billy never got to play. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Philip Rivers is, like you said, but he, he made it work. Yeah. Well, listen – Best of luck to you. I appreciate your sharing all this because I think it's an interesting story mm -hmm. to see how the other half has to try to skin the cat mm -hmm. because you're not from Oklahoma. You're not from Clemson. You know, by the way, I saw the Miami thing in the background. Yeah. So, so let's see what we got back there. Yeah. It's just a hurricane's helmet that's signed by a bunch of old Canes players. Um, Huge Hurricane fan for my whole life, just because I grew up a Hurricane fan. I mean, I've been sure. down here. I went there when I was a kid. My my dad had season tickets all the way until I started playing college football. He, he had to let go of those tickets because he was watching me play on Saturdays instead. But um, I, I think it's I think it's called for them. Yeah, it's called the U. And back then, yes, thank you. They were pretty good, Mike. Uh, best of luck to you. Uh, keep me updated on the progress. And uh, when you sign with somebody, we'd love to have you back on. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. That's uh, former Austin P quarterback Mike Delello joining us here on the show. We will keep up and, and see how it's going for him. After the break, we're headed to Rupp Arena, which was jam-packed last night for a visit from the Pope. And not that Pope, but Mark Pope. Stay with us. Hit After Hit has become the baseball store in Tennessee. They have over 1,000 different models of gloves and over 1,500 wood bats. They also have several Iron Mike pitching machines as well as a Hit Tracks machine. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it. We're proud to call Hit After Hit the official shirt provider of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Over the years, more men have started to seek help for hormone deficiencies and imbalances. And Dr. Jeffrey Lodge and wife Daphne, along with their experienced staff, give men the treatment required to improve their quality of life, improve your immune system, energy level, cognitive function, and more. There's no better time to achieve a healthy lifestyle. What are you waiting for? Give Cool Springs MD a call today for an appointment at 615 615- 486-3458 or visit the website coolspringsmd.com For over 35 years, Wilson Bank & Trust has been committed to providing customized banking solutions to help individuals, families, and businesses in Tennessee achieve their goals. 
As your full-service community bank, we are proud to offer loans with competitive rates, local decision-making, and fast, friendly service from our experienced lenders. No matter where you are on your financial journey, Wilson Bank & Trust is ready to help you take the next step. Visit your nearest Wilson Bank & Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Convenience and value, two words that we expect when we do business. Our goal at JHA Company is to deliver just that, both to our school partners and to our customers. Whether you're purchasing photos, yearbooks, class jewelry, letter jackets, school spirit wear, or senior graduation products, we strive to make the experience easy, convenient, and cost-effective. Find out more at jhacompany.com or call 615-867-6345 for more information. JHA. One source, one company. If you've ever been to a University of Kentucky sporting event, you have heard that song. And when they're on a run in basketball and they play that thing, man, it is spine tingling. So, Billy, they didn't get the big Rick Patino, Calipari kind of name, but they did get one of their own in BYU's Mark Pope. And I think Kentucky fans are going to warm to him. And they're going to warm to him huge and quick. Yeah, I don't know how he ends up <clears throat> performing at Kentucky. I mean, you, you, you never know. But, uh, it, you know, one thing it does feel like Mark Pope will do is, you know, bring some of the older fans back that had maybe gotten so sick of Calipari and then just and just weren't maybe as invested as they had been. Uh, but I think, you know, bringing Mark Pope in – there's there's a high floor here. I mean, I, I don't see this flaming out and becoming a disaster. I mean, I could be wrong there, but I don't. You know, I, I think he will he will bring back consistency. And I don't think. I mean, number one, I don't know that. I don't think he'll be able to bring in one and duns like Calipari did. A lot of a lot of people aren't even. I don't really, think they want to. Exactly. I, I don't think they want to either. So I mean, it's kind of a. I don't know how many he could bring in, but I don't think they want him you know, to, to do that either. I mean, I, I think they kind of want to steer away from that. And so I think that's one thing, getting core players, you know, back into the program and retaining them. Also, you, you know, you got to dip into the portal and, and they will, but just kind of bring back that, that hard nosed, you know, Kentucky style that, you know, he played with and that team played with in 1996 because let's face it, John Calipari's teams were never the toughest teams. And it's not like they, ever out executed you it was their talent and you know the the the, the five star one and done kids and i just think you got to bring back maybe some of that tradition some old school type basketball back to kentucky and i think that's what they're doing with with mark pope well he's going to get every benefit of the doubt because his 96 title team holy cow they should have played the lakers they were loaded so take a look at that picture for a minute okay they supposedly took out for the, and you might be able to see on the bottom floor that they took out some seats uh, so that they could do the big Kentucky sign. There looked like 19, 20,000 people in there. And think about it. They didn't hire Pope. What, Friday morning? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, look at that. That's insane. But what it speaks to is this. If you give them half a chance, they are the best basketball fan base in America by a mile. Not even close. Not even close. And, you know, I, yeah, I, I believe that when I, when I see that. Pope is our hope. There are a couple of things that were pissing Kentucky fans off. Number one... They were tired of Calipari lecturing them. This is the way you should act. This is the way you should, you know, and a lot of them early on, it was okay when he was winning big that they would put up with it. But when that stopped happening, 
you really heard a lot of Kentucky fans saying, shut up. We don't need your lessons on how to behave. And, and the other thing, Pope said all the right things last night. And I don't know, Billy, do you have on you the video of how they entered Rupp? I do. Just when, when we get a chance to show this here in a second, watch this. This is some pretty cool, like, last-minute marketing. So what they did, they were able to get a bunch of the 96 uh, national title team guys uh, together Mm -hmm. to come off that bus. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure Pope was thrilled to see all his former teammates because it's probably been a while since they've all gotten together. Now, the one I think he wanted to see the most, Jeff Shepard. Yeah. Yeah. We know why. Yeah, there was a point in the press conference where he said, uh, you know, as coaches, especially in college, our job is to be shepherds. (laughs) Yes, I noticed that. And every, I mean, there was about a a minute long period, maybe two minutes of the crowd just erupting. And, you know, I guess somebody got a video of it. Jeff, of course, you know, was laughing. Oh, yeah. uh, Who was the other guy? He, he, those blue glasses, you know, bald head like Jeff too. I forget his name, but you know, all he was on that Kentucky team, but they were all there, but that was funny. Was Scott Pollard there? I don't know. I I forget his Rex, uh, Rex Chapman. Rex Chapman is who I was talking about. Chapman was way before that. Chapman was late eighties. Oh, it looked Chapman was with the 96 team. He was at, yeah, I don't doubt he he might've been The, the, the story that got out Cameron Mills who used to do some, uh, you know, some Kentucky uh, broadcasting, you know, in their pre- and post-game. <laughs> the story got out that he was so excited that he didn't let his dog out for a long time, and the dog responded by peeing all over the, the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, that, like you said, they packed it out. They turned down about 5,000 people. So there Can you been- imagine? Upwards of th- of thirty thousand people. I mean, they should have done it outside somewhere. Could have done it at the football stadium. Who would have known? Um, I I, I would have always done it in Rupp. Yeah, but the thing is, they didn't know. I saw from somebody that you know they expected six to eight thousand, and you know, um, but they got a sold out Rupp Arena. Man. I guess did they have to pay for? They I guess they didn't. Have no, to pay it was to a free. It. it was a free um, event. So you yeah, know but, that that's one of the things that goes on now is that athletic departments have figured out, okay, we'll let the media ask questions, but it'll be used also as a fan, you know, interaction kind of deal. Yeah, and, and usually they separate. And I think they did it anyway. They separated the the media questions from, uh, you know, the the initial introductory, but they actually had the media ask questions in, in on the floor in front of everybody and, you know, uh, there was all kind of different eruptions from the, from the questions, but I mean, just unbelievable. I, yeah. I would have never expected that, but I, I can't be too surprised because it's, it's Big Blue Nation. What I like is the initial thoughts when he got hired were a lot of, well, they didn't get the big name they wanted. And you How know what? How does it go the, from that to this? I mean, <laughs> well, that's, think, that's my question. Well, a couple of things. Number one, it's the time of the year that this all sort of went down. I mean, if you think about it, this is about a month after most of the jobs come open. Think when Jerry Stackhouse got fired, which was on or about March 15th, and now we're at tax day. I hope all of you have enjoyed that. (laughs) Hello. Um, You know, so now we're a month later, And a lot of coaches are sitting there going, look, it's too late. Now, 
Billy Donovan, um, you know, has got a Bulls playoff run that may not be very long, but they're in the playoffs. They're in the play-in game against the Hawks. Uh, Jay Wright didn't sound like he ever had any interest. Um, help me here. Hurley said not no, but hell no. Nate Oates. Uh, Nate Oates came out very quickly. It was going to be awkward for Oates, you know, after he'd signed this extension to turn around two weeks later. Oh, my bad. I'm going to Kentucky. So it, it was kind of the perfect – it was going to take the perfect storm for it to get ever get to Mark Pope. And, listen, I would love to be able to ask him, okay, how close were you keeping up with this? Okay, this one said no. This one said no. We're getting close. Yeah. Because it looked like it was down to Bruce Pearl or Pope. And this is my belief, although I have no proof of this. Yeah. The AD at Kentucky, Mitch Barnhart, there is no secret he and Calipari disliked each other. Calipari intensely disliked Mitch Barnhart from being snubbed when they hired Billy Gillespie. Mm -hmm. So Barnhart put up with this for about 15 years from a guy that's got a, you know, a good dose of arrogance and, and, you know, humility's never been way up on Calipari's list of adjectives. And so I wonder if he went Mark Pope over Bruce Pearl, A, because Pope played on a national title team, B, because he doesn't seem to have the arrogance that a Calipari had and is not going to bring the circus to town quite the way Bruce was. Now, if they'd hired Bruce, oh, my God, Trump Arena would have been on fire. Yeah. I wonder, would this, no matter who they hire, would this, I think that arena would have been like that. You think? Just because they have a change and. On, on this particular day, you mean what they did yesterday? Yeah. I, you might be right. It I, may be a fan base that was so happy. We got a new coach. We got a new voice. It's no longer Calipari. Let's turn out in droves. Yeah. Well, and, it, and I mean, it's a perfect. Perfect job by Barnhart and this administration, I think. Credit to to them for, for getting this done and, and getting Mark Pope in there because it's an easy, easy way to, to you know, make the fans feel some nostalgia when they're back in Rupp Arena. And, uh, you know, again, who knows if it works out, but, I mean, at the very least, there is a change. I think this is more of a celebration of, okay, we're not, you know, we're not, uh, we're not controlled by Calipari and his ways anymore. You know, we kind of take back our program, and Mark Pope is going to, you know, the fans ask for something, Mark Pope will do it, you feel like. He's, he's that type of guy. Um, and I'm excited. I mean, he's, he does feel like a, a guy that'll maybe, I don't know, I don't want to say go too far, but, you know, he'll, it feels like he'll do whatever it takes is what I'm saying. Well, I hope we're able to get him on this summer because I'm going to try to make that happen. Um, I, I really am curious what his last week was like, because who was the last one? Scott Drew yeah, that said no. When Scott Drew said no, there had to be out in Utah a house going, oh, my God, we may get the call. Yeah. But then you got to temper that if you're Pope with, yeah, but Pearl's still out there. I mean – I don't know why they never made an attempt, best as I can tell, at Brad Stevens, uh, who who may well have told him no, and I don't know it. Pearl seemed to be the next one. When they didn't go there, it's Mark Pope. They've hired the Pope. They've hired him. And, and right away, I think, I mean, we talked about this. I was like, man, I don't know how this, I don't know if this is going to fire up the Commonwealth or not, but. It obviously did. It seems like it sufficiently did. So are they going to put, like, white smoke coming (laughs) out of Rupp uh, Arena every time they have a big win? This was obviously fake, but I did see something on Twitter with some white smoke. Oh, they put it, you know, basically over Rupp Arena. But, uh, but no, I mean, that was a cool scene yesterday. That was awesome. Hey, show show one more time Rupp Arena. The, uh, oh, the picture? Yeah, the, the, the crowd. 
look at that. So as a, as a college student, the first time that I ever got to go to Rupp, I sat in that upper deck, and I'll say this, it's a ways away. You might want the binoculars. That night, uh, Kentucky played Alabama, and the winning coach was a guy named C.M. Newton. Little did I know that three years later, uh, I would forge a friendship with him that, uh, that lasted until uh, he passed away. We'll go to the break. When we come back, we'll have stat of the day. Me by myself. Yep. And then we'll get you a little Titans news. John Stiff uh, will join us, and the name of the newspaper is The Center Square. He wrote something a couple of weeks ago that got by me, but I retrieved it, and now we're going to talk about it. You're going to want to hear it. Nashville. Get ready for the greatest show on turf, electrifying, high-octane, non-stop spring football action. Starting at only $30. Don't miss the season opener this April 27th at Municipal Auditorium. Hi, I'm Jeff Fisher. The Nashville Cats are bringing arena football back to Nashville. Grab your tickets now at thenashvillecats.com and be part of the action. Star Physical Therapy was established in 1997 with one great mission, to serve. If you're hurting, don't wait to receive physical therapy. You don't need a referral to see their physical therapist, and early morning and evening appointments are available. Make the call to 615-673-1420 and get rid of that pain. Star Physical Therapy, the official health provider of Football Friday. You were in a crash. Yeah. Your kids were in the car with you. We're very lucky to even be telling this story to you. Nikki treated us like family, and she was very caring and loving, and I'm just so grateful for that. She was somebody I could trust, and being a veteran, that's so important to me. My kids are going to have a better life now because I don't have to worry about those expenses that we were out. Your family has really created a legacy of trust, and I would recommend you to anyone. Nashville Sounds Baseball is back in Hit City for the 2024 season. Spend your nights and weekends at the ballpark with weekly giveaways, fireworks shows, throwback deals, live music, and more. Top talent will take the field at First Horizon Park against the AAA Minnesota Twins, Baltimore Orioles, Atlanta Braves, St. Louis Cardinals, Cincinnati Reds, and more. Tickets start at just $10 and are available now at NashvilleSounds.com. We will see you in Hit City. Venture Express has been helping people in this area for more than 40 years. They're headquartered in Murfreesboro with over 30 years of dedicated fleets involving production, manufacturing, and corrugated experiences. They're an asset-based company with over 700 tractors, 4,000 trailers, and 800 drivers. If you need their help, dial them up 615-793-9500 or log on to VentureExpress.com. Top of the hour on a Monday. We're getting set to talk to John Stife and talk a little Titans uh, new dome stadium. See what's uh, see what the latest is there. But first stat of the day brought to you by John English Antique Sports and Cards in Shelbyville. You can find them at 204 East Depot Street. They're open during the week, Tuesday through Friday, from noon to 5, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5. Give them a call, 931-492-4304. All right, we are going with the women's side of basketball today, and we're going a little Caitlin Clark theme. Here we go. The WNBA draft is tonight, and Caitlin Clark is projected to be the number one pick. She won AP Player of the Year this year, but only one freshman has ever won the award. Who is it? Okay, I, I'm going to take a wild guess. I have no idea. 
Let's go with Shamiqua Holtzclaw. That's your that's your uh, that's your shot. Why not? I, I have no idea, <laughs> not a clue. Well, it's even more recent. Paige oh, Beckers. Oh wow! Uh, a few years ago, did she really? Yeah, she kind of got overshadowed. She the did last a couple bit. of years. Yeah, I, but, I mean, uh, she's probably the biggest star if you take Caitlin out of it. Yeah, you could go Angel Reese, and you know, of course, Juju Watkins. But you know, Beckers had a pretty pretty darn good career herself. So. Well, at least if I was going to get it wrong, I was quick. Yeah, you uh, you get the pain out of the way. Okay, so we welcome all of you into hour number two of the show from our digs at the Ford Ice Center in Bellevue. This story for me kind of got lost in the shuffle uh, back five weeks ago with all the basketball and the tournaments going on. Titans projected to sell $270 million dollars in PSL licenses at the new stadium. John Steiff from the Center Square wrote this piece, and I wanted to have him on. John, thank you uh, for taking the time to come on with us. Hey, it's great to be with you. Let me say up front that my friend Butch Spearden was one of the spearheads of doing a second wave of PSLs, which I believe will be a disaster. Uh, I don't think those who bought it the first time, I don't think are going to do this in any big chunks, but this is just my editorial. I wouldn't have gone this way, but they have. Where did the number 270 million come from? So I sat there and I watched all the sports authority meetings and all the city council meetings, and they did a lot of estimating. And in one of the work meetings of the sports authority, uh, the bond council for the city of Nashville mentioned that number and he had it on a chart. After he did it one time and I wrote a story about it, that number never appeared anywhere else because the Titans don't want that number out there. They don't really want people knowing what those numbers are going to look like at this point because because that's going to be a high percentage of the Titans' contribution to the overall stadium. Um, and, it, and it's interesting because they actually have a model to go on with this because the Buffalo Bills are doing the same thing right now, only they're, what, a year ahead. So they're actually bringing people in the building right now uh, for the premium seats and kind of showing them and they're getting the first sticker shock of what the new PSL prices are going to be. And at their stadium costs a lot less uh, or or a little bit less. Their prices are going to be a little bit less than the Titans. And they're estimating that it's going to be $200 million that they get from theirs. John, Help me to understand this piece of it, because the Titans have been in a rush to let you know that Amy Adams Strunk is going to put up $840 million. I don't believe that's the case at all. I think she's putting up $840 million minus, if it's $270 million or whatever. Am I right? So, yeah, she's definitely not putting up that number. As we know, there's NFL loans that are part of that number that, what is that, like $300 million they're going to get loans from the NFL. They'll put $270 million up from PSL sales. And they also sold to Nissan again, I'm sure at a higher price, but they don't release that price, the naming rights for the new stadium. And that goes towards it too. So this is not, this isn't the owner putting 840 towards it per se, just like out of her pocket. This is this is a combination of all these other things that helps them come up with that number. But they have certainly gone out of their way to make you think it's 840. Oh, for sure, because they want to have people believe that, hey, the state put 500 million towards this. We've got all these tax captures at the stadium. They're going to contribute towards the bonds that are going towards it, you know. They want people to say, oh, oh, the team put a large portion for, towards this. You know, for a while, the the previous administration in Metro Nashville was trying to say, well, the largest portion of this, if you divide it all out, 
is actually coming from the team. That was never true, but they wanted to say that. Yeah, I, I don't think we've uh, we've gotten the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So l- let me toss this one at you. Um, the Titans also try to make you think that they don't know these numbers yet. Thus, we're in this four-corner stall of not releasing the numbers. Uh, best as you can tell, when are they going to release them? And in your opinion, is all hell going to break loose when they do? They're definitely going to have a negative reaction. So what happened like a month ago is Larry Miller um, from Memphis tried to put forward legislation that would cap the increases on the PSLs from the old stadium to the new stadium at 20% for people who had held them for 10 years. And the Titans had a large negative response to that. Uh, and the bill didn't end up going forward. He, he tried to start with, okay, it has to be even one-to-one, and then he quickly understood that's not how it's going to work. And then he tried to put that 20% cap, and he still uh, he couldn't get enough support for it because there were a lot of legislators that said, okay, we're not going to get involved in a private business and, and how they can price things. You know, and, and on some level, that's certainly understandable, but it's a it's a whole different thing when you're talking about, OK, the state just gave 500 million and all the sales tax at the stadium and half the sales tax and everything that they build around it. You know, John, repeat for me, if you can, um, the state senator's name that uh, that tried to to go in this direction. Larry Miller from Memphis. OK. Um, yeah, I he's bl- a representative. He's not a Senator. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So what exactly I, I keep hearing, I, I'm a, I'm a day one season ticket holder of the Titans and have, have had them all the way through. And I suspect foul play on a couple, three things. Number one, the 840 million. I never thought that's what she was contributing. I always thought it was 840 minus whatever they can sock the ticket holders with in PSLs. Um, So what exactly are the Titans doing right now with existing season ticket holders to try to start this process? So to start, the PSLs that currently exist, and, and I was surprised to see this, the, the prices range from $250 for the worst seats to six, $64,000. There's seats in the current stadium that there are PSLs for that. So the current PSL holders are going to get a credit that's, that's worth the amount that they paid for the previous one, and they can put that towards what the new one is. And the new one's certainly going to be much higher. What they told Representative Miller was, and this, again, was maybe three, four weeks ago, they said within six months they'll have those prices out. My guess is that it will be similar to what's happening right now in Buffalo, where the highest end ticket holders and PSL holders are invited in first. They're going to get a sheet of paper that says, this is what you get. This is how much it's going to cost, and it, it's going to be more than 20% more than what your current one is. Apparently, some people have already, some uh, PSL holders already received a survey with estimates of what those prices could be and trying to get responses. And the Bills did that too, trying to see, okay, is somebody who has a $350 one right now willing to pay you know, two grand per seat? What, where's that, where's that price level going to be? John, about, I want to say 11 months ago, I did a show that was nothing but this. I had Burke Nihill on from the Titans. I had Butch Spearden, who I've been friends with for years and years from the Convention and Visitors Bureau, because he was one of the real movers and shakers that saw to it that this stadium actually happened. And then, um, from the uh, Metro Council, Berkeley Allen joined us. And I was shocked that however many council people there are, 
Not one of them at any point ever thought to ask the Titans exactly how many dollars are you trying to raise off PSLs? How, how stupid can that group be to not have that thought? Now, in the East Bank uh, Stadium Committee meetings, it, PSLs were brought up a few times, but certainly not that specific question. And and when it did come up as a portion of the whole, it was something that the Titans and, and Burke didn't necessarily want to respond to. There's a lot of things that they'll say, okay, the NFL doesn't allow us, or we haven't determined that yet. I, I heard him say that several times about PSLs in the process, just because, you know, as, as a reporter covering it, the people really want to know that's an important part of a new stadium is, okay, how much is it going to cost me to get tickets at this new stadium, especially with all the tax money that's going into it. So I, I kept a close eye on when that was mentioned. It was mentioned. It, it was asked. It was more in committee meetings than necessarily the entire council. Um, I, you know, again, I'm being very cynical, but how can you run a business where you're asking for a $2.1 billion stadium and you don't know the prices of what you're going to charge? There's no way in hell that's true. I would have to agree 100%. They know what the price is. They, uh, just like the city and the state came into this process and they had, they had all these sheets with numbers all over the place and, and estimates of, of what's going to come in from each one of these separate taxes, like the new hotel tax, the, the, depending on what they build around the stadium, that sales tax collection, they have estimates of all those things. And there's no way that the team isn't working off something like that. The difference is, the things that the city works off are obtainable for the public and, and the things that Titans are working off uh, are not. In fact, you know that that's true because at the very end of the process in front of the Nashville Council, there was a consideration of, of amending the deal and adding a ticket tax to the higher price ticket events at the new stadium. And the Titans came back and were adamant that this was a deal breaker for them, that the math didn't work that well. We know that you know all the math then. You're just not telling us all that math. So, John, let me ask you this. What's the next step in this whole stadium process? What's, what's the next thing that's coming down the pike? In terms of pricing for tickets or in terms just, of, I mean, in, building in, it? Yeah, in terms of now we've had a groundbreaking, it looks like we're going to start soon. Are there any other votes on anything that take place before all this is done? Well, the stadium's happening. The key elements now are what gets built around it. And, you know, they've, they've hired the people that are going to build around it. But it, it's really important, the timeline of what gets built around it, because all of the financial mechanisms for paying off the bonds for this are dependent on on the things that were always going to be built around the current stadium it never happened and and now are going to be they they almost have to be built for the new stadium because everything is dependent on that tax money starting to roll in within the next five ten years i want to ask you one last question you may tell me george I just simply can't answer this. One of the things that I believe has been put out there that I don't believe is the truth is that the NFL has told Nashville that the size of this stadium, which puts it at almost the lowest capacity in the NFL, and I think I know why they've done it, because the Titans haven't been able to sell tickets for a good while. They have had a lot of empty seats in recent years, so they've cut the capacity from the 69,000 plus at Nissan down to around 60. But they have been rushing to tell us that the NFL has made it clear to them 
that by no means does this prohibit a Super Bowl coming here. I don't believe that. I don't, first of all, I have never heard Roger Goodell say, yes, Nashville could get a Super Bowl with this capacity. What do you believe to be the truth on this? I actually believe differently than you. Uh, I think that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't do this stadium without knowing that they were going to get a Super Bowl here. I believe there will be a Super Bowl in Nashville. I believe that with that much public money going into an NFL stadium, the NFL feels obligated to do that. And I think when you talk about stadium capacity, one of the things that, you know, Burke Nihill said so many times is that uh, it's it's not necessarily about the number of seats that are in there. If you look at the designs, there's all these common areas where people will go and congregate. The people that are not necessarily caring as much about the down-to-down intricacies of what's happening on the field, and it's more of an event for them to go to. So I I think that uh, I think that there's a Super Bowl coming. The state legislature is in the process of passing a bill right now so that the Tennessee Department of, of Tourism can negotiate with the NFL out of its mega project fund in order to make that happen. I, I think that every indication is that that's going to happen at the new stadium and that the capacity number of seats is not related to whether the NFL is going to do that. Okay. I hope you're right. I I would love to see our city get a Super Bowl. Nobody would be happier. I'm just a little suspicious that as money grubby a league as the NFL is, they want every last dollar and they want something more than 60,000 seats. But I hope you're right and I'm wrong. Great job on the reporting. Thank you for taking the time to share all this info. Hey, happy to join you. I mean, the NFL sent a Super Bowl to Detroit in the cold weather center because (laughs) they built a new stadium. Come on, they're going to send one to Nashville. I hope you're right. John, thank you for the visit. Appreciate it. Thanks. John Stife from the Center Square joining us on the show. So, Billy, what would you learn there? Well, I mean... Super Bowl's coming to Nashville, I would guess, after that. I mean, he's covered this, and he's, he's he is pretty confident. And, uh, you know, I mean, look, I, I'm not – I may not have the room to speak on this, but, I mean, I, I would like to think that, it, it, you know – he made a good point with the public money, the amount of public money going into that stadium. Uh, you would feel like the NFL does have an obligation, but, you know, we'll see. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you well, end up being right. I hope you're not right, though. I don't appreciate the fact that I don't think we've gotten the truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They have tried their damnedest to give us this, she's putting up $840 million, and he admitted it's not true. Yeah, I think that's pretty widely known. I mean, he the way John was talking to, uh, the Titans walk around it a little bit, walk on eggshells every time they're asked about it. So that's going to be the, the next, you asked about the next step. I mean, that, that could be it, maybe. Do they well, release it? I mean, well, look, the cynic in me believes they'll release it the next time they have a huge win that has the city, you know, really right. yeah. juiced up yeah. about Titans football. That would be the time to do it. Yeah. Um, but I'm a little cynical. In well, fact, I'm more than a little cynical. <laughs> I've become very cynical in my old age. After the break, And the word I'm going to use is not a good one. But Jason Aldridge is going to join us to talk about, he'll cringe when I say this, a gizmo, a piece of machinery that is doing wonders for sports fields and sports teams. We'll learn about it next. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. 
Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bar Durham. And you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. The George Plaster Show is Nashville's best sports talk, 2 to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. There's a podcast version available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. From embroidery to screen-printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges, they have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, custom cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen printed t-shirts, laser engraved Yeti cups, and knives. Recognize your hardworking team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolensville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615 615- 256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. So I did a horrible job of explaining what this next segment is going to be all about. But think about all the high school fields, for instance, that you have seen lined. And you see some poor coach who drew the short straw taking a, like a ruler or a piece of rope and trying to, to do the yard lines straight or when you go out to a sounds game and you've seen over the years the um, the the ground crew trying to line the base pads, well, all of a sudden, there's something new out there. Now, Jason Aldridge, who's going to join us in a minute, probably flipped his lid when I called it a gizmo because I don't know the proper name. Uh, he works with a company called Turf Tank, and what they have come up with has revolutionized uh, this area of the sports business. Let's bring Jason up here. So if it's not a gizmo, what is it? <laughs> well, George, it, it would be called a robot. So I don't know if you've got a Roomba around your house, but it's kind of like a Roomba for sports fields. Um, it's a GPS-guided paint robot that, like you said, it'll paint any sports field that you need outdoors. It'll do it perfectly and reliable every time. So we're going to show some pictures that you sent me uh, to give people a little bit of a description. This is Wrigley Field when Northwestern was going to play a football game there 
uh, when you get to Wrigley Field, that's pretty high cotton. Yeah, you know, I think I told you uh, that I grew up a Cubs fan. I, I'm, I'm from Nashville, from Middle Tennessee. Grew up listening to you on the radio for many, many years. And Nashville never had that major league team, right? So it was either the Reds, the Braves, or the Cubs. And I gravitated towards the Cubs. So it was really special when we had the opportunity to be able to paint Wrigley Field whenever they um, have a football game. This is actually the second time um, that we've been able to do that. So they come in and put sod over the whole infield and put our robot out there and, and paint the football field. So it's pretty awesome. I love it. Let's go to another picture here, uh, which will be very Knoxville and Rocky Top related. Uh, take that one and run with it. Yeah, so the we have a lot of Division One and Division Two down to NAI colleges that use the robot, and University of Tennessee is one of ours. We actually have Vanderbilt, University of Memphis. Actually, I listened to you earlier. Austin P has a robot, even. So uh, University of Tennessee uses the robot to paint all of their sports recreation fields. So, you know, not everybody plays sports just at the collegiate competitive level, but you've got a lot of college students that want to play flag football or lacrosse or whatever club sport. And so the University of Tennessee at Knoxville has a robot and they paint all those sports rec fields uh, with our machine. I love it. Let's go to picture number three. Uh, this is Nick Saban related. Yep. So if you recognize the hat, um, this was really a big uh, milestone for us to kind of get into the Division One major, you know, college programs. And so uh, the University of Alabama was really one of our first big Division One colleges to to get the robot. And just to give you an idea of the workload that, like a Division One competitive uh, athletics has to paint fields and in Tuscaloosa there's three and a half practice fields in their complex they've got like the walls of Jericho around it you can't see what's going on inside but you know you've got these natural grass fields and they paint those practice fields every Monday and Thursday and so when we introduced the product and we were able to demonstrate it to the University of Alabama staff, they were just blown away and they were like, this is going to change, you know, of all the pressure that we have to make the grass look great and the lines look awesome. Um, and so it's been a real hit. Uh, Alabama actually has three robots. So two of the robots are used on the competitive athletic side, but then also the, the student recreation department has a robot for the student rec fields as well. Billy, I think we've got one more picture. Uh, and this is uh, Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. Yep. So, again, kind of those big milestones for us as a company. Uh, Raymond James Stadium, where the Bucks play, uh, they were our first professional team uh, at the NFL level to, to get the robot. So they, they use it for the, the game field. They use it, their practice facility. Actually, Raymond James Stadium is owned by the Tampa Sports Authority. Right, And so they have a huge soccer complex as well right there in Tampa. Uh, and they have two robots there that paint soccer fields or lacrosse fields. You know, they, they host tournaments almost every weekend of some type of sport. And so the Tampa Sports Authority loves, loves our machine. Um, since we got the robot at Tampa, we now have the Jaguars, the Bengals, the Patriots, the Seahawks, um, and, that, and plus the Bucks that, that use the robot. So it's pretty awesome to see, you know, Division One college football programs, uh, NFL teams. But I think the thing that really resonates with us as a company is our product is affordable and is even used at small soccer clubs across Metro Nashville or the local high school team. Even your Battleground Academy has one. We talked that about that. a baby. Now, Billy, let's, what, what about Father Ryan? Yeah, they're probably too cheap. <laughs> Father Ryan doesn't have one, do they? Uh, Father Ryan has synthetic turf, but I don't know if they have uh, natural That's grass right. practice fields. So, you know, the synthetic turf world is a, a big player in some schools having it or not. Um, but, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if Father Ryan has it or not. But 
a lot of private schools, public schools in Nashville have it. That Billy, it comes down to if you would give a contribution to the school, <laughs> they might have more money and availability to do this. I'll look into it. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I'm sure they breathlessly await that. Jason, who walked in one day and said, I have a gizmo, whatever that robot. means. Robot that will revolutionize sports. Who did it? Well, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a neat story. Um, I grew up in Nashville, listening to you, like I said. And when I was in middle school, just to kind of give you the thought process, in middle school, I was the high school football manager, right? And my parents wouldn't let me play middle school football yet. I ended up playing in high school, but. I remember they handed me this aerosol can on Thursday nights <laughs> and I was having to paint these fields. Right. And my hand, my fingers were freezing, you know, about October, November. And I was like, what in the world is this? <laughs> I thought I was the water boy and the ball boy, but, um, but I ended up going into my career um, doing technology, uh, doing sports management and, uh, work for a company called Huddle, uh, which probably a lot of your listeners is, are familiar with. It's a it's a video editing company. Sure. Um, so I, I worked for them for about four or five years, uh, and then literally one night I was watching Shark Tank, and I was just brainstorming with my son about what would be kind of the next coolest invention that we could bring to the sports industry. And I turned to my son, who was sixteen at the time, and said, "Hey, would it be cool if we could make a robot that paints sports fields and like a typical 16 year old he rolled his eyes and said whatever dad <laughs> you might um, ought to let him know it's going to fund his college education exactly exactly um so but I, that was in 2016 um so i kind of took that initiative and uh, found a group of guys in denmark they're really smart with robotics um and so we we formed turf tank um, and, and brought the, the robot to here to the United States and just started selling it one robot at a time. So um, 2017, we had four customers in the U.S. Now we're going to cross 3,000 in the Man, U.S. That is awesome. That's how much we've grown in yeah. that short period of time. Are you allowed to tell me what one of these robots costs? Sure, absolutely. So when we first started the company, we only had an outright purchase price, but we wanted to make it affordable to anyone, right? We didn't want just NFL or Division I programs to be able to afford it. So we created a subscription program, almost like your Netflix account, right? Um, or some type of annual subscription that you pay. So we have a very affordable subscription program that is as cheap as $6,000 a year up to $16,000 a year. And what we do is we give you the robot, we train you, we give you paint, we support it, give you different levels of, of service and warranty, and you use the robot and pay for it on an annual basis. And what that does is it allows you to experience immediate cost benefit you know, for what you're paying for, you're, you're getting the return on your investment because again, you're not out there freezing your fingers off with aerosol cans. I love it. This is so good. This is such living proof that if you get, get your wheels spinning a little bit, you may, you may be the next person that revolutionizes something that I end up calling a gizmo. Yeah. Uh, it's an incredible story, Jason. Um, I mean, you, you've got to, at some point, kick back in that chair and go, can you believe this? It's, it's pretty surreal. Um, we have a great team of, and we have almost 150 employees now from me being on my couch to, to where we are now. So <laughs> we have an amazing team that, um, works hard every single day, uh, to make the life of sports turf managers easier. Um, and that's our, that's our motivation. And that's what we try to accomplish on a daily basis. So, you know, it's, it's the people that makes the product awesome and uh, the, the focus that we put and, and we, it is awesome to see, you know, athletic directors that maybe 
they were going to retire because they were just tired of painting. Their field. <laughs> now they're working longer, right? Uh, because they're like, hey, I got a robot. I can do this. Um, so we, we really are making a difference um, in coaches' lives. You know, coaches would have to normally paint the field on a Thursday night. Oh, day absolutely. And not be with their families, which is already a struggle, right? But now they can get that done and spend more time with their families. So there's, there's just – huge benefits to what the the product and what the company does for um for for people turf managers coaches booster clubs whatever and so yeah it's it's very rewarding i, I love it it's best job in america I, I besides your job i mean your job would be <laughs> don't believe that uh um, which by the way you know we were talking a lot about kentucky i have a quick rup arena story for you oh lay it on me okay so i have two rup arena stories so I grew up, I was born in Kentucky. I mentioned my parents met at Western Kentucky. Right. Um, and so I kind of gravitated to rooting for Kentucky back in the day. So I was actually at the Vanderbilt Kentucky game when Kentucky beat Vandy. You were there when they won the SEC. They went undefeated. They brought out the brooms. Oh, yeah. So I was sitting behind you uh, the, in that national championship year. And <laughs> Um, you and I are actually in the Sports Illustrated National Championship catalog. There's a picture of where they're throwing a cheerleader up in the air, uh -huh. and they have a shot of her, and you can see you behind the booth, and you can see me wearing a white hat. So me and you are in, in – uh, we, we are in Sports Illustrated together, George. Hey, will you bring me that picture Wednesday? Absolutely. I want to see it. Jason's coming out. Uh, to meet Eli Gold and Jeff Fisher on Wednesday, and we're looking forward to having him. Congratulations on what you've gotten done. Man, this is this is a cool story. And please tell Scott Yaffe that I said thank you for turning me on to this. Um, this, is, this is really good. Awesome. Thanks, George. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Okay, when I told you you were going to learn some things today, that maybe you didn't know going in, Billy. I told the truth. That was really cool, and and I, I mean, I, there's probably so many other questions you know you wanted to ask. I, I, I'm really interested. Maybe we have him on again or get to talk to him on Wednesday just about the 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 science and the and the technical things behind this. I mean, how oh. do you like if you want something in your on your field? How do you get it to do exactly what you wanted to, oh, want it to it's do? Incredible. And, um, but yeah, looking forward to meeting them. And uh, that what a what a story. That that's awesome. It is. It's it's an amazing. I mean, it's one of these things where, okay, we live in the greatest country in the world, and it's called a free enterprise system. And he has taken the free enterprise system to the max. Yeah. He created something. His company created something that nobody was doing and look at him. Yeah. R really cool. And obviously with a background in sports being at huddle and, yeah. kind of, you know, everything kind of probably helped along the way, but uh, amazing, that's really, really cool business. Now here's how he can lose all of that money fast. <laughs> Absolutely. With uh plasters better today, brought to you by Bart Durham injury law. Give them a call 615-242-9000 or log on to Bart Durham.com. And let's check out what happened over the weekend. And it was only one game. We're not – basketball season's over, so no yes. more uh, big, long weekend bets. But the Preds won, and all of a sudden you are one yes. went away from 500. So all of you are assuming I'm going with the Preds tonight. Well, guess what? I'm not. And I'll tell you why not. I'm worried about tonight because Pittsburgh has so much at stake. Tonight, their season is on the line. And this is going to be a really inspired Pittsburgh team mm -hmm. that plays the Preds tonight. I think it's at 6 o'clock. Uh, I've been telling everybody 6. So I probably ought to look at this real quick and make sure that it is at 6. Okay. Here's what I am going with. Go ahead. I, there's there's no graphic. Oh, my Lord. My apologies. Kelly hold would be on. ripping me. Yo. Did you forget? Yeah, hold on a minute. <laughs> Let me think about who did I take. You took an NBA um, team. No, there's no NBA game tonight. Okay. So, I am taking 
Philadelphia as a huge favorite tonight at home against Colorado. Aaron Nola pitching for the Phillies. This ought to be a layup if you're willing to lay the heavy price. If you're not, then take the Phillies minus a run and a half, which will get you much closer to even odds. Tomorrow on this very show, Billy, Tony Basilio will join us. Can't wait. Can't wait. It was a big weekend for Vol Baseball. You know, they had the spring game over the weekend as well. Uh, but one more piece of news here, George. Before what do you we, got? Nick Saban will make his ESPN debut on April 25th, of course, next week, covering the NFL draft on ABC. So I don't know if, we, if uh, that was announced publicly yet or not, if anybody was even talking about that, but he will make his debut for the, uh, the NFL draft. Our show will originate tomorrow from Lipscomb's Dugan Field. Lipscomb and Vandy will play tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Looking forward to that. And then Wednesday, we'll be back here for the Eli Gold Jeff Fisher lunch. If you would like to make a reservation, simply email me, plastergeorge at gmail.com. Do me a favor, do it tonight because we got to let them know how many folks to expect. We're done. We'll see you tomorrow.